Hello friends and welcome to this week's video. I hope you had a lovely week and that you are ready for a very fun video. I had quite a fun week where I got to visit the Milk Museum in Oslo. It just recently reopened in a new location, in a much much larger building than previously, and that means that more of Milk's artworks are now available to be seen by the public. And today I'm recreating his most famous artwork, The Scream, but with a twist. I will be replacing the main character of the painting with Ghostface, a notorious killer in horror movies. While you'll be watching me paint, I would like to share with you some details about the painter and the painting. Let's first talk just a bit about the man behind the artwork. Edward Munch was born in 1863 and died in 1944. He is one of the most significant artists in the modernism era. His experimentation within painting, graphic art, drawing, sculpture, photo and film have given him quite a unique position in the Norwegian as well as in the international art history. And this is one of the reasons why it is great that the new museum has expanded so much because I got to see a few of his sculptures, as well as uh, photographs and lithographs. He was active throughout more than 60 years, which is why he has so many artworks. He made his debut in the 1880s, and he practiced art right up to his death in 1944. He was part of the Symbolist movement in the 1890s and a pioneer of Expressionist art. Now, because I know that all of you can just Google him up and read about his life and how unfortunately it was filled with sadness and illness, I want to share with you more interesting stuff, a few facts that are not so much talked about. Like many of us artists do, he did not always take care of his art. In his villa at Ekeli, he had pictures and tools and books all scattered all over the place. Many of his pictures were even stored outdoors, and there were even human footprints and traces of dog paws that were found on both prints and drawings. There are still remains of water damage, bird droppings and candle wax which can be spotted on several of his paintings. And this is honestly of no wonder to me. As an artist, I can understand that not all paintings are valuable, not all drawings are valuable, well, to the one making them. So they can just be put wherever, as long as they don't stand in our way. As many artists are, he was envious of another artist. He was envious of Gustav Vigeland, another proeminent Norwegian artist. While Munch received a lot of attention abroad, in Norway he was somewhat envious of his rival, the sculptor Gustav Vigeland. Especially after work on the Vigeland Sculpture Park started around 1920s. This is a must-see for anyone visiting Oslo. It's a park that I've been countless times in and it's more and more fascinating with each visit. Not only Munch's artworks are preserved, but there's a lot of his writings kept. In one note, he compared the public funding of uh, his work and uh, Vigeland, and he said, We read about the millions granted for Vigeland's so-called gift. My artworks are as important as his for the art community and the country alike. They also need lots of space and money in order to be executed and shared. And, in another note, a sassy one, might I add, he wrote, Yes, people are different. Look at how we make a fuss over Vigeland. A mere spit from him and we preserve it in gold. There, there was not, no social media to have the success of all the other artists rubbed in your face, but jealousy always existed. A fun thing is that he invented the idea of the cell phone. In an undated draft of a letter to his friend, the Danish painter Jens Willumsen, Munch wrote, Had I been in possession of the as yet undiscovered little remote telephone which one carries around in one's pocket, 
you would have long ago received communications from me. He actually took great interest in technical innovations. He acquired a film camera, a parlograph to record voices, a telephone and a radio. And in the museum I actually got to take a look at how one of his houses was set up and where he had all these items. It was fascinating to take a look back into history. Staying within uh, modern ideas, Munch eventually became a vegetarian. Late in his life he stopped eating meat. However, he did continue to eat fish. Perhaps it's correct to call him a pescatarian. In another letter he wrote, As a member of the vegetarian cult, I say, Convert from cannibalism, do not eat your uncles and aunts or little cousins with shiny eyes. Eat instead, like the lamb, the lily, the lily of the valley and the grass. You are in fact half vegetarian already. Cognac, burgundy wines and champagne are the blood of the grape. A bit dramatic, a bit silly, but to each their own. As you've probably gathered so far from these brief snippets of his notes, Munch tended to be pretty petty. Which is why he drew caricatures of his enemies. He argued with and picked on members of his previous circle of friends, such as painters and authors, and annoyed many art critics, especially those of the daily Afton Posten. Munch chronicled his frustration with others in letters and notebooks and also drew spiteful caricatures of his enemies. In a drawing from around 1908, two authors, Heiberg and Brötker, who were associated with a Christiania Bohemia, the circle which Munch frequented in his young days, were immortalized as a type of human swine and an emaciated poodle in the company of a toad. You know what, I think I will actually start doing that at some point. When I'm pissed off at someone, instead of being pissed off, I'll just draw them in the worst way possible. Just let my sadness, frustration and all of it out on paper. That could be fun. When it comes to painting portraits, he actually painted quite a few self-portraits. But not only that, he took lots of what we now call selfies. He was an avid photographer and left behind numerous photographs. He photographed himself in front of his paintings, in beds, in the garden, and often in profile. I guess that's what was trendy back then. A really cute fact about Munch is that he was totally a dog person. He cared greatly about his own dogs. And he even said that uh, an old wise man's soul has taken up residence in his dog. I mean, I think most of us thought of our pets that they're really, really intelligent and they act like wise men. I know I thought that about my cats at some point. Well, at least about one of them, the other is not so bright. Anyway, he both painted and drew his dogs, but first and foremost they were there to keep him company. And the boy, one of his dogs, was even occasionally bought his own cinema tickets. I mean, that's a bit excessive, but sure, if you have the money to do that, do it. I do consider he was quite an interesting and fun person. Now let me tell you a few things about the painting that I'm uh, reproducing here. For the most part, we all know one version of the painting. But the truth is, there's multiple versions of it. The scream has been uh, reproduced plenty of times by Munch and there are possibly more versions of it than we know of because it was popular with his clients which wanted it to be reproduced again and again. But from what we know he created four versions, two in paint and two in pastels. The first painted version was the first exhibited, debuting in 1893. Right now it is in the collection of the National Gallery of Norway in Oslo. But the original version that is the most known version is really interesting because this version has a barely visible pencil inscription on it, which says in Norwegian, could only have been painted by a madman. There is also a, ver a pastel version from that year which may have been a preliminary study and it is in the collection of the Munch Museum. 
and that is the one that I got to see now. Or was it maybe the second pastel version from 1895? That version went through a lot of hands, a lot of selling back and forth, but eventually it got to be in the collection of the Munch Museum. Additionally to these painted versions, Munch created a lithograph stone of uh, this composition in 1895, from which several prints were produced by, by Munch. And there's quite a few that still survive. I think there are still six of them available in the Munch Museum collection. Munch's most famous motif, the scream, is an open narrative. The main protagonist is strangely enigmatic. It belongs to no class or culture, has no specific gender or ethnicity, and is strikingly timeless. The motif probably originated on an evening stroll that Munch took with his friends in 1891, as the sun was setting over the Asla Fjord. In the years that followed, he explored the motifs diligently in sketches and texts, and, as I said, made four colorful artworks and dozens of prints. While all the versions are different, they are all equally powerful. One thing that should be noted in all of these artworks is the group of men Mung has placed in the background. They're standing on a straight road that disappears into infinity, which makes their distance from the figure in the foreground even more obvious, maybe leading to the idea that what arouses angst and despair in one person may be insignificant for another. Personally, I think that it is a really striking artwork. And the more you look at it, the more ways you can find to interpret it. So, while there are quite a few versions of, of this painting, not all of them can be on display all the time. But Moon creating all versions of the scream on cardboard or paper, which makes them more fragile than oil paintings on canvas. In addition to factors such as temperature, humidity and oxygen levels, like the exposure must be limited, because light affects the color pigments in the pictures and also breaks down paper and cardboard over time. The museum has conducted several research projects to establish how much light the various versions of the screen can withstand each day. And none of them can be exhibited all the time, so the pictures in the room are displayed on rotation. And let me tell you about the room because I thought it was really cool. So there is a really huge floor with uh, a lot of his most famous paintings. But in the middle of that room there is a smaller room. But inside that room it's dark. It's completely dark. And the artwork is backlit. And with all that said, I think one of the most interesting facts about this painting is that it was stolen in 1994. In 1994, in the lead-up to the Olympic Games, Norway's National Museum moved their version of the Scream from its usual location to a ground floor gallery as part of a showcase of Norwegian culture. Obviously now this is interpreted as a controversial move, because it's considered that the ground floor of museums is the hardest to secure. But the gallery considered the security cameras and alarm systems to be sufficient to protect their national treasures. Unfortunately, they were wrong. At 6.30 a.m. on the 12th of February 1994, the same day as the opening ceremony of the Olympics, the museum's alarm went off. Obviously, the police was immediately alerted and they arrived at the gallery in just a few minutes. But they were too late, because the heist took only 50 seconds. That's less than a minute. Quite impressive, to be honest. And the thieves were quite sassy and even left a postcard behind in the gallery. And it read, thank you for the poor security. Now, only hours later, the museum's director addressed the press, uh, stating that the scream was Norway's most valuable, Munch's most renowned, and it would be impossible to sell. And, of course, that makes sense, because who wants to buy such a well-known stolen artwork? Pretty much no one. So, one month after the theft, the National Gallery received what seemed to be a ransom letter, and the thieves demanded $1 million to return the painting. 
And mind you, this painting is worth a hundred and twenty million dollars. Now the gallery refused to pay. Quite ballsy. So instead they turned to Scotland's Yard's Arts and Antiques squad for help, and the British police developed a sting operation. They had two undercover officers who offered to buy the painting for $250,000, so way less than the thieves actually requested from the gallery, but they still accepted. The painting was recovered in a hotel in the beach resort of Oskortstrand, and it seems quite fitting that the scream would be found there since Munch once owned a cottage there and he painted many of his famous works there. There were four men who were arrested and convicted of theft and attempting to steal stolen property. The gang was led by Paul Enger. He was sentenced to six years and three months in prison. And he was no stranger to art theft. He had already spent four years in prison in the late 80s for the theft of another of Munch's artworks, The Vampire which is definitely one of my favorites, and I have a print of it. However, in an unfortunate twist, the convictions of the three other thieves were overturned on a technicality. The thing is that the undercover detectives had entered Norway using false identities, and that was a violation of Norwegian law. Well, anyway, after his release, Paul Enger legitimately purchased a Munch lithograph at an auction in 2001. That's one of the strangest thieves I've ever heard of, but okay. So these were just a few facts that I considered to be interesting. I hope you enjoyed uh, learning a bit about one of Norway's most treasured artists, and obviously that you enjoyed watching me paint this artwork. I really enjoyed visiting the museum and I enjoyed most of all seeing Munch's darker lithographs. He touched some darker themes and uh, styles of execution in his artwork. And I, I really enjoyed those. I will definitely have to go grab some prints of them, because those are pure inspiration. But with that said, that's pretty much everything I prepared for you for this week. I truly hope you enjoyed it and that you got to relax listening to all of this. If you're interested in art more than mine, I definitely recommend you to take a look at Munch's life. He did live a long and full life and it's very interesting to learn about him and his artwork. Other than that, here are the final shots of the painting. And until next week, stay spooky.